فاشرف بي لاشتغال بالعلم ولا تبغي به ما عشت يا ذا بدلا ويا له من شرف عظيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته brothers and sisters Welcome back to our Q&A session in Ramadan uh, with Ustad Abdurrahman Hassan. The first question is, I deliberately had sexual intercourse with my wife during a day which I was making up from the previous Ramadan. Is the expiation obligatory upon us both and what and is what we have done a major sin? Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen والصلاة والسلام على من أرسله الله رحمة للعالمين وعلى آله وصحبه وإخوانه إلى يوم الدين أما بعد Anyone who corrupts his fasting of Ramadan or a fasting which he is paying back from Ramadan or any fasting which is obligatory um, by intersexual intercourse for instance or other than it without a legislated reason then there's going to occur to him there's going to happen to him uh, that he's fasting or this ibadah which he has done then becomes null and void and of course he gains from that sins and it becomes obligatory for him to have to pay it back of course other than ramadan ramadan has another specific ruling which inshallah ta'ala we're going to mention so the evidence that it's obligatory for the person to have to pay it back is very apparent in the hadith of Umm Hani radiallahu ta'ala anha she said that the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam shariba that the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam he drank sharaban a, a juice or a drink so he gave it to her to drink it فقالت, she said inni sa'imatun walakin karitu an arudda su'raka when she drank it, she said to the Prophet, Ya Rasulullah, I was fasting. And I disliked to turn back your leftovers. I didn't want to turn it, reject it. Then, the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said to her, إِنْ كَانَ قَضَاءً مِنْ رَمَضَانَ فَقْضِ يَوْمًا مَكَانَهُ وَإِنْ كَانَ تَطَوَّعًا فَإِنْ شِئْتِ فَقْضِ وَإِنْ شِئْتِ فَلَا تَقْضِي The Prophet said to her, if it was a paying back from Ramadan, then bring back another fasting for it. So you have to bring back that fasting again. So if this fasting that you were fasting right now was a fasting of expiation, in other words, you were fasting from a Ramadan that you missed, days that you've missed, is that, if that was the fasting, then the Messenger said to her, bring back another fasting for this. That you've just broken right now as for if it was a voluntary fasting then the prophet said if you want bring it back and if you want don't bring it back you're not obliged and it is not mandatory onto you so that's the evidence to show the wujubul qada that the person has to bring it back if the fasting is a payback for ramadan they have to bring it back the evidence to show that the person will receive sins from this action of theirs uh, for corrupting their fasting which was obligatory on them deliberately is the statement of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala وَلَا تُبْطِلُوا أَعْمَالَكُمْ And do not nullify your actions. So here this ayah وَلَا تُبْطِلُوا أَعْمَالَكُمْ is general and it shows that you're not allowed to nullify any actions of yours whether it be whether it be Ramadan or whether it be other than Ramadan. It doesn't matter. And if you go against the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we know that a sin occurs from it, because Allah says, وَلَا تُبُطِّلُوا أَعْمَالَكُمْ Allah specifically is commanding us not to nullify our righteous deeds. Now some people argue and they say that the hadith that you have quoted, the hadith of Umm Hani radiallahu ta'ala anha, is in it an evidence, okay, that the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam didn't reject her doings. He just told her that she has to bring it back. But the Messenger Alayhi Salatu Wasallam did not rebuke her or scold her in any way, form or shape in this action that she did, which is to drink. 
And so they say we take from this an iqrar, that the Prophet consented to her action, that it's permissible for you to break it. So where are you going with this ayah? وَلَا تُبْطِلُوا أَعْمَالَكُمْ so we, And they then go on to saying, and then they go on to saying, that if it was haram for her what she did, and it was wrong, then the messenger would have clarified it to her. As the qa'ida is, تَأْخِيرُ الْبَيَانِ عَنْ وَقْتِ الْحَاجَةِ لَا يَجُوزُ Delaying the thing that is needed at the time it's needed is not permissible in for the messenger alayhi salatu wasalam. He has to clarify it. And Imam al-Shawkani rahimahullah responded to this. And he said that this argument of theirs is غَيْرُ صَحِيحٍ It is not right and it's not correct. Why? Because the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, first we have to understand is that he commanded Umm Muhani radiallahu ta'ala anha to bring back that fasting. That's one. The second point is that, this is the kalam of Imam al-Shawkani, is that the condition of them, for you guys to use iqrar, consent, so for you guys to use consent as an evidence, the condition is that, that there is no hujjah, there's no proof that shows from another angle that the reason why the Prophet ﷺ chose not to speak about it was because it was both agreed on both parties. Then there would be no need for the Prophet ﷺ to have to mention this. I want you to understand this point. To use the Prophet's silence as a consent here wouldn't be allowed for you because we, we, if there is an evidence that shows that Ummu Hani was aware and she knew that what she did was wrong, there would be no need for the Messenger ﷺ to have to mention this to her or to tell her that what she did was wrong. So the question is, is that do we have a narration or do we have evidence to show that there was no need for the Messenger alayhi salatu wasalam to have to mention to Ummu Hani that what she did was wrong. Of course we have an evidence for that. And Imam Tirmidhi rahimahullah he narrated that Ummu Hani herself came to the Messenger and she said, Inni adnabtu fastaghfir li. I have committed a sin. A mistake. Ask forgiveness for me. Then the messenger said to her, وَمَا ذَاكَ What is it that you did? قالت, she responded by saying, كُنْتُ صَائِمَةً فَأَفْطَرْتُ I was fasting and I broke my fast. And then the messenger said to her, أَمِنْ قَضَاءٍ كُنْتِ تَقْضِينَهُ Is it a qadā? Were you paying back a fasting? She said, no. Then the messenger said, فَلَا يَضُرُّكَ Then it doesn't harm you. So this is a mafhum. That if it was a qada, it would have harmed you. If it was a qada, it would have harmed you. That's mafhum al-mukhalafa. And another riwayah of Abu Dawood, which he added onto it, فَلَا يَضُرُّكِ إِنْ كَانَ تَطَوْعًا It won't harm you if it's a voluntary fasting. So then this narration of Abu Dawood emphasizes even more the mafhum that we took from the hadith, which is that if the fasting is an obligatory fasting, which is qada, paying back, then it will harm you. Now the question is, the question is, is that now that we've proven that she has to pay it back, the sister, and the second thing that we also proved is that sin is going to come from it. Can we say that this sin, it reaches the major sin or is it a minor sin? We've already proven it's a sin. But is it a minor sin? Some of the ulama, they said, it's a minor sin, because there's no specific evidence that has come and shown that it's a major sin. Okay? There is no uh, wa'id, there is no warning specifically to this particular action. Some, which is the next party of scholars, the second party of scholars, they said that no, it's a major sin. And I think that is stronger because they have brought an evidence forward. And that is that the hadith of Abu Umamat al-Bahili, رضي الله تعالى عنه that the messenger صلى الله عليه وسلم he said في رؤيا منامية that ثم انطل ثم انطل قبي فإذا أنا بقوم معلقين بعراقيبهم مشققة أشداقهم تسيل أشداقهم دما قال قلت من هؤلاء قال هؤلاء الذين يفطرون قبل قبل تحلة صومهم أما تحلة صومهم so the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he saw a group of people who were being punished. Alayhi Salatu Wasallam. They were what? They were being punished with their internal organs. And the Messenger and blood was gushing from them. So the Messenger Alayhi Salatu Wasallam, he asked, he said, who are these people being punished like this? 
and it was told to him that they are the ones who break their fasting before the sunset. They break their fasting before the sunset. So this hadith shows that it's a, it's a major sin. If it wasn't a major sin, then the Messenger والسلام, would have not told us this grave and this serious punishment for them. So what I say to this particular uh, individual is, uh, is to come back to Allah and repent, to come with righteous actions, and also to come with qada, to bring back this fasting. And as for kafara, then the kafara is not for the fasting except Ramadan. Specifically in the month of Ramadan, the fasting that you're fasting, the expiation for that is when you deliberately have sexual intercourse that you have to do what? And a kafara. The kafara is not outside Ramadan, even if you're paying back a fasting of Ramadan. The reason for that is because the fasting of Ramadan is a wajib which is mudayyak. It's a wajib which is restricted at a particular time. And as for the sawmul qada, it is not mudayyak. It is mutlaq. It's unrestricted. And the scholars, as we know, they differ between the wajib which is mudayyak from the wajib which is not mudayyak. The wajib which is restricted from the wajib that is not uh, restricted. So we say to this sister, and also there's no particular evidence that says that they have to bring back, that they have to do expiation for this particular fast. So what we say to this particular, what we say to this sister, inshallah ta'ala, is uh, to fast and bring back that fasting, ask Allah for forgiveness, and come with righteous, uh, with righteous actions. Naam. The second question is, my sister was sick for two consecutive Ramadans and she did not co compensate any of them due to her illness. Recently she died. What should we do in this, in this case as her family? Naam. First of all, I say may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bestow his never-ending mercy onto the sister and forgive her for her any shortcomings that she has come with and resurrect her with after that anyone who dies and there is fasting upon them and the fasting is an obligatory fasting such as Ramadan then it's upon the family of the dead that they feed every single day of those days which they have missed are poor and they, they pay nisful sa and we previously spoke about what is nisful sa and it is not permissible that they fast on behalf of that person the reason is because the fasting of Ramadan is like um, the fasting, uh, sorry, the, the, obliga the obligation of fasting of Ramadan is like prayer. And as we know, it is not permissible for a person to pray for another person, the salahs that they've missed. The fasting is the same. As long as that, that, as long as that fasting is, is not siyamu nadrin. As long as that fasting is not a fasting of nether. The reason is because there is a specific evidence for this. Siyamu nether is when a person makes an oath to Allah wa ta'ala that if Allah does this for them that they will fast. Then this fasting becomes obligatory on this person and if this person dies then the family f fasts on his behalf. The reason why the fasting of nether that is permissible for someone to fast for another person is because it's like a debt. Money that's debt, you don't have to give money to anyone and you're free from having, having to give money to anyone. Unless you place yourself in a position where you take money from somebody, then you would have to pay back that person that you took the money from. You are the person who made it obligatory on yourself to have to pay it back now. But originally it was not obligatory on you to have to give money to this individual. The same is the fasting of nether. This fasting was not obligatory on you. Now you've burdened yourself and you're the one who placed it on his shoulders 
to have to pay back this fasting. So because it's like a debt, you have to pay back that debt. And that's why the Messenger alayhi salatu salam, he said in the hadith of Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, man mata wa alayhi siyamun saama anhu waliyuhu. That anyone who dies, man mata anyone who dies, wa alayhi siyamun and is fasting on him, saama anhu waliyuhu. His family fast on his behalf. And yes, this hadith is mutlaq, is unrestricted. Okay? But it's meant by the fasting of a nether. It's meant by the fasting of nether. The reason is because the fasting which is nether remains on the person's shoulders just like the debt remains on your shoulders. And it does accept for someone else to do it for you just like debt, someone else can do it for you. And that's the madhab taken by Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, Ibn Abbas. And it is also narrated from Sa'id ibn Jubayr and Ahmed ibn Hanbal. And also it is what was strengthened by Ibn al-Qayyim al-Jawziya rahimahullah. And there are two narrations that strengthen that understanding. Which is, number one, Hadith ibn Abbas radiallahu ta'ala anhuma. Ja'a rajulun ila nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. A man came to the messenger. And when he came to the message, he said, Ya Rasulullah, inna ummi matad wa alayha sawmu shahrin. My mother died, and upon her is a fasting of a month. Afa'aqdihi anha. Do I pay this back for her? The messenger said, Law kana ala ummi kadaynun, akun taqadiyatu, akun taqadiyahu anha. He said to her, if your mother had debt on her, would you have paid back that debt for her? So this shows you that this fasting was a fasting of nether. Because a fasting of another is a fasting that is a debt, as we showed right now. And then the man said, yes. Then the messenger said, فَدَيْنُ اللَّهِ حَقُّ أَنْ يُقْضَى That the debt of Allah is more befitted to be paid back. And there's another narration that strengthens it even more, which is, أَنَّ السَّعِيدِ بْنُ عُبَادَ رَضِيَ اللَّهُ تَعَالَى عَنْهُ إِسْتَفْتَى رَسُولَ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهُ وَسَلَمَ فَقَالْ سَعَدْ بْنُ عُبَادَ questioned the messenger and he said, he said, إِنَّ أُمِّي مَاتَتْ My mother died. وَعَلَيْهَا نَذْرٌ A fasting of a nether was upon her. Then the messenger said, إِقْضِهِ عَنْهَا Pay it back for her. <coughs> so all of these narrations, they show that the illa of why these fasting is made is obligatory is because it's like a dain. Just like Sawmu Nadr is a dain. Other than that, the statement of Abdullah ibn Umar still stands, which is, لا يصوم أحد عن أحد. No one should fast for anyone. And this statement of Abdullah ibn Umar, it spread amongst the companions and no one ever went against him regarding it. So what this shows us is that when Abdullah ibn Umar was saying this, he meant by it what? He meant by other than fast of nether. Other than the fasting of? The fasting of a nether. So if the fasting is fast of nether, then the family have to fast on behalf of the dead. If not, every fasting which she has missed. So you said two months she missed. Those two months, a poor has to be given nisful sa'ah. Nisful sa'ah. Naam. The next question is, is a woman allowed to go out at night for the taraweeh prayer? Um, if the woman is leaving at night to fulfill the salatu taraweeh with the consent of her guardian and her husband, and there is no mafsad and no harm that's going to come out of her leaving her house, then it is not correct for anyone to prevent her from leaving if she wants to go out and pray in the congregational prayer and participate in the good that is there. But if when she leaves the house, there's going to come from it fitna and darar, harm and trials and tribulations, then the prayer in her house is better for her. Based on the hadith of the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, لا تمنع نساءكم المساجد وبيوتهن خير لهن. Do not prevent your wives from going to the masjids, and the house is better for them. And also the hadith of Abdullah ibn Mas'ud رضي الله تعالى عنه 
that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Salatul mar'ati fi baytiha afdalu min salatiha fi hujratiha wa salatuha fi makhda'iha afdalu min salatiha fi baytiha. That the prayer of the woman in her house is better than her prayer in her balcony. Okay? And also, for her to pray in her inner chamber is better for her than to pray inside her house. So the more that the woman is hidden, the better it is. Naam. The next question is, what's the correct opinion regarding the ruling of women participating in Salatul Eid? The asal that we have to understand is that that the women are equal to the men when it comes to the jurisprudent rulings. When it comes to rulings, men and women are the same. What's obligatory on the women are obligatory on the men. What is voluntary for the men is also voluntary for the women. They are shaqa'iq. They are the same and they are equal in rulings. So when Allah is speaking to the men, also He is speaking to the, to the women. Um, unless of course there's an exception and there's a delil that shows that this is specific for the men and not specific for the woman or is specific for the woman and not specific for the men or not for the men this evidence which is the issue of praying Salatu Al-Eid what has been seen from it is that the men and the women are the equal so there's no specification for any individual rather it shows that they are equal in terms of ruling. And the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he commanded for the women to come out when the Salatul Eid is taking place. He even told the women who don't come out of their houses to come out. He also told Ali, Dawatul Khudur, Wal Huyad, and the women who are on their menses. And what did he say to them? Stay away from the place where the people are praying. To the extent that the Messenger والسلام, he commanded that the woman who doesn't have a jilbab, that her sister should give her her jilbab to wear. If she's got a spare jilbab, that she gives it to her. Even if you don't have a jilbab, you need to look for a jilbab. To come out based on the hadith of Umu Atiyah anha, and also the hadith of Ibn Abbas anhuma. and the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in the hadith of Ibn Abbas he said kharajtu ma'an nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam yawma fitrin aw adha fa salla thumma khataba thumma ata al-nisa'a fa wa'adahunna wa dhakarahunna wa amarahunna bi sadaqa that the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam he came out um, Abdullah ibn Abbas said I came out with the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam of the day of fitr or adha the Prophet ﷺ, he prayed, then he done the khutbah, then he came to the women, he reminded them, he gave them a reminder, and he told them to pay sadaqah. Salatul Eid, as we fully know, is the thing that if it happens that Salatul Eid and Jum'ah happen on the same day, Eid will make Jum'ah drop. If you pray Salatul Eid, then you don't have to bring Salatul Jum'ah if they happen to be on the same day. But what we know is that مَا لَيْسَ بِوَاجِبِ لَا يُسْقِطُ مَا كَانَ وَاجِبًا That if the Eid was not wajib, if it wasn't wajib and it was voluntary, then how can something voluntary drop something that is obligatory? So it could only be that the Salat Eid is what? Obligatory. And the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, as we know, he hasn't commanded the women for the Jum'ah. He hasn't commanded them to come out on Jum'ah. He permitted it for them, alayhi salatu wasalam, and he allowed it for them, but he didn't make it obligatory on them. As we know, salatu kunna fi buyutu kunna khayrun min salatu kunna fi duri kunna, wa salatu kunna fi duri kunna afdalu min salatu kunna fi masjid al-jama'ah. So the Prophet tells them that the house is better for them, salatu al-jum'ah. Whereas when it came to what? When it came to salatu al-eid, he tells them to come out, even if they're on their menses. Even on their menses. And what even shows that it's obligatory and that is the correct opinion is that the hadith narrated by Imam Muhammad and Bayhaqi and other than them from the hadith of the sister 
the sister of who? Amrah binti Rawaha. She's the sister of Abdullah ibn Rawaha. And this hadith is, is, is authenticated by Hafid in his Fathul Bari. He said, وَقَدْ وَرَدَ هَذَا مَرْفُوعًا بِإِسْنَادِ اللَّا بَأْسَ بِهِ And Albani authenticated in Sahih al-Jami'ah. That the Prophet ﷺ has said, or the narration says, وَجَبَ الْخُرُوجُ عَلَى كُلِّ ذَاتِ نِطَاقٍ That the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam made it obligatory on every single woman on the day of Eid to come out. He made it obligatory on them. And that's the madhab of Abi Bakr, and Ali ibn Abi Talib, and Abdullah ibn Umar, رضي الله تعالى عنهم. As Qadi Al-Qadi Iyad narrated, and also Ibn Abi Shayba narrated. So what we say is that Salatul Eidi is obligatory on the women, just like it's obligatory on the men. The virgin, the, the widow, the divorcee, the young, the one who are menses, all of them have to come out. And when they do come out, they have to make sure that they observe the etiquettes of coming out the houses. What do they have to leave off? Min tatayyub. Don't place perfumes on yourself, sisters. And you're also not allowed to adorn yourself and beautify yourself on the street. Um, but what she has to be upon is غاية tasattur. She has to go to an ex- 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 extreme levels of making sure that she hides herself. Naam. And we'll stop there inshallah ta'ala. Subhanakallahumma bihamdik. Ashadu an la ilaha illallah. Astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayhi.